Hello, and welcome to our webinar for the 2022 Global Year for Translating Pain Knowledge to Practice. I'm Benjamin Farrell, Coordinator of Global Programs at IASP, and we are excited to present this webinar and hear from our speaker. Today, we will be hearing a presentation on a functional subdivision within the somotensory system and its implications for pain research. IASP are thankful for everyone who could join us today and remind you that today's webinar will be recorded uh, and available for later viewing at the ISP's Pain Education Resource Center. I'd also like to encourage our viewers to utilize Zoom's Q&A feature to ask any questions you may have during today's proceedings. During this webinar, I'd also like to ask for everyone to remain muted and cameras turned off to avoid any distractions. At this time, it's my honor to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, Claudia Sommer. Dr. Sommer is a professor of neurology at the University of Würzburg, Germany, where she serves as a consultant in neurology, organizes an outpatient clinic for patients with pain, and leads the Peripheral Nerve Laboratory. She has written more than 250 original research papers and more than 100 reviews and book chapters, and have edited books on neuropathic and facial pain. Today, she also serves as IASP's past president. With that, I'd like to thank you all again for joining, and I'm happy to pass today's proceedings over to Claudia and look forward to hearing from our speakers. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much, Ben. And um, hello, everybody. Hello to our listeners out there. I'm Claudia Sommer, immediate past president of ISP, and I'm here together with Professor Heike Rittner, who's one of the chairs of the 2022 Global Year Task Force, and she will also be here to answer any questions you have. Today, it's my great honor and a pleasure to introduce Shifu Ma, Professor Ma, who is a long-standing professor at Harvard Medical School and the Dana Farber Cancer Institute, and uh, recently also at the Westlake University in China. He received a bachelor degree at Fudan University in 1987 and later his PhD from UCLA in 1995. He worked as a postdoc in different institutes and uh, very soon then became an assistant professor and later a full professor at the Department of Neurobiology at Harvard Medical School. He has been studying somatosensory circuits for pain and itch for a long time, and uh, his research includes neural development, spinal circuit mapping, and also the scientific research on acupuncture studies. Already as a postdoc, he identified the mammalian neuronal determination gene neurogeny. And uh, after genome sequences were published in 2001, he led several labs at Harvard Medical School to compile an expression map for 1,200 transcription factor genes in the developing nervous system. And uh, from this map, his lab identified two master regulators, RUNX1 and TLX3, that you certainly have heard of, that control primary and relay nociceptor development. In um, recent years, his lab has started to study the scientific basis behind acupuncture practice. His publications are in the journals Cell, Science, Nature, you name it. As you can see, this is really a remarkable career. And uh, I'm very happy, Professor Marr, that you're here today to share your insights on how translation in pain research can become better. The floor is yours, please. Yeah, and uh, first of all, I would really, uh, uh, really would, would like to, uh, to thank the, the Benjamin, Heike, and Suleiman and for organizing uh, this event. And I, I wish the Suleiman was here today, but he's trying to recover from a bad flu. And uh, I would also really uh, thank uh, Claudia for hosting uh, 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 today's uh, talk. And, uh, and uh, so, so in my talk today, actually, um, um, it's really based on the 
perspective article um, I published early this year regarding the functional organization of the somatic sensory um, system. And then we will particularly I will discuss how this organization will impact on how we measure pain in animal studies. And uh, with a goal, you know, try to hopefully can improve the translational uh, um, research. So the um, the motivation behind um, this uh, uh, article I, I wrote, you know, of course, this uh, accumulated from many years, you know, study, but it's to looking for the the issue, you know, facing the pain field, like we, the pain research field still um, pay, facing a lot of challenge. Like for example, the, um, the pain treatment still has a lot of problem. For example, in, in the United States, uh, beside the pandemic, we also uh, facing the, the opioid crisis, for example, even just in the past years, uh, the opioid overdose, you know, killed. 110,000 you know, uh, people in the United States alone. And also at the same time, the, the pain research field, I think face, faces some kind of frustration. So uh, through the many uh, years study, we had a lot of successful stories and, and molecular targets. Maybe it looks like it could be a magic bullet for treating the pain, but those stories has um, have not yet translated into new pain medicines. So right before the pandemic, um, the United States, the NIH actually organized an international pain workshop and uh, discuss, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, so what could have um, gone wrong um, in animal study? They, the, that workshop mainly discussed, you know, how can we model better uh, to study the pain model in animal, like mimic more clinical relevant pain. And, uh, and how can we improve, you know, behavioral analysis or measurements so that to better reflect the sensory emotional experience of the pain experienced by humans. So, so with that, you know, part, I think the relevant, this kind of context, you know, I, I let me see the, um, the I, in this particular, perspective article I wrote, you know, I will try to make argument, say the so, um, so, so my sensory system may organize in two major branches, like in, uh, in response to the noxious stimulation, and these two branches could drive the two different sets of behavior. Like imagine we touch a, a hot stir, the so first response, we will withdraw our hand because the, the mental state is about, all about oh, this, object is too hot. It has a chance to cause damage and the behavior is, uh, is to withdraw the, uh, your hand to prevent the injury. And uh, if the withdrawal is successful as a no damage, no skin lesion, then we, we, has an, we will have no problem. Uh, we have no much uh, like emotional uh, problem. But if, if you finger get a badly burned injury, like all the blister, and then your mental state is no longer on the external stress, but rather your mental state will focus on the, the, your body injury, you know, your body integrity disruption. And uh, with this kind of injury, then will produce a tonic lasting pain. Then we will drive a different set of behavior, not the behavior you focus your injury, then you're towards the injury, like licking, blowing air, and those kind of self-caring responses, not it's about yourself. The purpose is to reduce the suffering. So the question is a, this two line behavior, you know, at what level, you know, axial level, you know, within the somatic sensory system, um, can, we, we can start to see the segregation in driving these two sets of behavior. So, so here I will, starting with a, uh, um, looking at this uh, organization so of the so sensory system in driving those two sets of behavior. So let me first start with some of the insights we gained from the uh, human, human study, particularly human brain lesion study. And uh, you, that kind of lesion study, then we will make analogous lesion in animal study to reinterpret the, uh, the significance of the all different kinds of behaviors. So, 
So one of the important contribution of figure in the lower pain field is Henry Head. He, he's a British neurologist and he published many interesting thoughts in the, on the organization's so sensory system. I think he could have a much larger impact on the pain field, but I, I don't think he made a large impact because I, the pain field didn't pay great attention to his uh, you know, historical uh, contribution. For example, in this paper published in 1911, he studied the salamic syndrome patients with a stroke and a lesion causing the region in lateral, most lateral part of you know, the, 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 the salamus. Sorry, I sometimes I have, I have difficulty to speak our words. So lateral salamus. And we know that lateral salamus is a relay station linking somatosensory input to the somatosensory cortex. And in another study done in Germany, the Mark Plonner, in 1999, and he has another patient has a you know post central gyrus you know lesion covered, including some sensory cortex. This patient shows the same phenotype almost. They lost the sensory discrimination. They cannot tell the types, intensity, location of the sensory stimulation. They they also lost the unpleasant feeling to those noxious stimulation only like low or moderate, like a low level unpleasantness. But this patient, they all retain the intense unpleasantness when the stimulation is intense and strong can cause actual lesions. So the, um, then the, um, another study in 1960 almost supporting and or because at that time the Henry head he makes it like oh there is some kind of medium for the lateral subdivision within the some uh, within the and uh, the thalamus and then the in 1960s a uh, group of um, neurologists at MGH Massachusetts General Hospital and Harvard Medical School here and uh, the they has a different set of patient has a median salamic lesion. And in this set of patient, the phenotype exact almost opposite. They retain the sensory discrimination. They uh, retain the unpleasantness if the stimulation is moderate, but they lost the intense unpleasantness or emotional distress to those injury causing actual body injury. So they really almost don't care, you know, the stimulation can cause the, the, the at least no emotional attachment to those injury. So then both the lateral and median salamic uh, pathway eventually converge to some like a, a, a forebrain region like an inferior cortex and an ACC, anterior singular cortex. And the patient with the, like ACC lesion, they will retain the sensory discrimination and they will lose all kind of like unpleasantness, you know, or emotional distress to injury causing uh, uh, stimulations. So based on this is a, a human patient study, uh, uh, Melsa Casey and uh, 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 Don you know, Price, Price in, they, they propose some kind of like some, or in you know, you know, some way support like Henry had, you know, the median lateral, uh, and organization of the somatic sensory system. Yeah, keep it. And um, I'm too sensitive my screen here. So the like with the lateral pathway, like a phenomenon with ex exteroception, like a sensory discrimination, and it driving the uh, defensive or reflex in you know, a behavior. But the median pathway is more important for the sensing the body integrity disruption, like so those are real injury causing the tonic pain, and those are more like a mental state deal with the interception. Also Howard feel, you know, he's saying that the, the feeling, the degree of unpleasantness you feel is a part of the sensory discrimination, like encoding the, the stress level. So it's a little bit mixed here. So with that, you know, the human and data, then we, we, we want to reclassify animal behavior. And we, by using the, again, use the brain lesion or spinal cord lesion to see how the, those kind of behavior will be impacted. So first such behavior I want to mention here, which everyone all familiar in the pain field, is uh, the, the, the withdrawal, spinal reflex withdrawal responses. So here we measure the lowest mechanical or thermal threshold to cause the hypo to withdraw. 
And, uh, and uh, this kind of behavior we have, have been used for a long time to measure acute pain for mechanical or thermal pain sensitivity. But uh, this behavior are preserved in spontaneous animal like a cliff wolf did in 1984. You know, all this rudimental, men, like a primitive and defensive you know, mechanism is a, it's a, it's really driven subconsciously, even can be done in a, in a spinal core level. So mean that even it has a conscious motivation to do this, but, a, but a, the subcortical circuits already can do it. It can mask, you know, the you know, animal study it can mask your conscious motivations. The next set behavior, when the threat increase and not start could impact your body integrity or affecting homeostasis, then the new set behavior will emerge like a suprasmanal defensive reaction. This set behavior requires suprasmanal circuits. You know, uh, mean that they, uh, you know, spontaneized animals, they, those behavior will, will disappear. For example, if you trap the animal in a hot play, not measure the latency of the withdrawal, but it gives sustained, you know, exposure, and the, then when the the animal cannot you know, get rid of the, you know, noxious stimulation and the next set's behavior emerge like a jumping, you know, to try to jumping out. And uh, the other one, like this a use for sumo uh, regulation, behavioral sumo regulation, like a, um, a temperature chamber selection assay, like when animal choose, you know, the environment and less, you know, hostile, you know, environmental temperature. This is a behavioral sumo regulation that saves energy to, and to keep the body in you know, homeostasis. And Jerry Gephardt in 1980s with King Hess, you know, they developed studies of physical pain. They developed one of the assays called a physical model reflex in response to colorectal distension. And all this assay, uh, you know, uh, still preserved in animal with, with a cortical lesion, like for jumping and a physical model reflex. That when in a decerebrated animal, this is a behavior all preserved. And when your lateral salamic lesion still the animal still preserves the you know, behavioral thermal regulation. While in the middle brain, like a parabrachial uh, brain lesion were causing a loss of like jumping or uh, behavioral thermal regulations. So this is a behavior by nature still is defensive. It's a mental state, it still deal with the threats. You know, you see this environmental threat impact my body integrity. The last set behavior, I skip one set behavior for the uh, uh, face pain I'm not discuss here today, but uh, we talk about uh, once a tonic pain, so not that when you have a real injury, injury causing stimulation, and, you, and when animal cannot get rid of, or the inescapable, for example, when you inject the formalin, capsaicin, b venom into the hind pole, with it's already in, inside your body, and uh, you cannot get rid of. Or in my lab and with uh, Bob Lamore, we developed a pinch, you know, assay in mice and, and he did it in a human, like this uh, inescapable, you cannot shake out, you know, this uh, alligator clip will produce a long lasting pain rating correlated with a long lasting like a licking behavior in, in mice. We also did as a skin, real skin burn injury. We saw, you know, when you touch a hot stir, only when you blister, when it, real injury, you have real suffering ongoing. So we did a relatively mild, you know, skin burn injury, but we still need to separate by mice in certain minutes because the, there's a real skin burn injury. So the mice will cause a non-stop licking. And all this uh, behavior is a, now you generate a behavior toward your own injury area to, with the purpose to reduce the suffering. And in terms of formalin or b venom induced uh, uh, licking and a guarding behavior, Actually, those behavior is ACC dependent. And I say a number of studies showing ACC lesion uh, will cause this licking response while preserving those like lifting, flinching behavior. So with this kind of analysis, you can from functionality point of view, the other behavior have two type behavior. One is deal with the external threat, like it generates as a reflexive defensive behavior. Your mental state at that time is all about external threat. So you generate a behavior to prevent or limit injury. When this kind of first line defensive behavior finish, and when you still have an ongoing body injury or you cannot get rid of those uh, injury causing uh, stimulation, 
Now you change the second sex behavior toward your own body, which is called interoceptive behavior, like looking to reduce the suffering. So the question is, again, you know, I suppose be, at the beginning, at what axial level, you know, this kind of behavior or the neural circuit driving this kind of behavior start to segregate. So here I was showing a few examples, uh, you know, that even at a primary sense of neural level, already see a distinct DRG neuron and central neuron drive this kind of extraceptor defensive reaction to the threat for the in interoceptor response to body injury. So in a single cell sequence, recently done by Patrick Ernfer or many other lab like David Gindy, they classify a number of the DRG neuron. Um, here we focus on this, uh, the track A lineage neuron, meaning that the neuron developmentally depends on nerve growth factor receptor track A for survival. And uh, my lab actually has been for many years and uh, studied the uh, neural development uh, when I joined at Harvard Medical School. So here, this slide, you know, we can use developmental biologists that we can reclassify and the sensory neuron from here to here. So you can already see the sensory neuron is, has some kind of hierarchical organization. So only the bone neuron was making the pro, you know, like a low stretch mechanical receptor, proprioceptor. Within the whole track of linear neurons, the, the first way will generate those myelinated A delta nose receptor, which we, we know important for like a sharp first pain or, or for innocuous cool sensation in humans. But here, without going into detail, the phasma just a C fiber and mine in the C fiber. You can see it has an only developmental, say some kind of developmental segregation. And I, I will show you one group neuron based on the a transcriptional factor the expression called the wrong one. I shall show next slide. Basically, we found the track lineage C fiber can be divided into two larger groups. One group has a persistent Ronsman expression dependent on Ronsman for developmental uh, formation. And all this neuron terminate, mainly terminate skin epidermis or tissue derived from ectoderm, like a teeth, you know, epi epidermis hair follicle. Those including, those are, the largest population polymodal nose receptor uh, marked by MRGD expression. So it responds to the mechanical and the somal stimulation. And they, so another group called C, C fiber low stretch mechanical receptor expressed like a, a TH um, um, positive. And also including co sensitive triple MA positive and uh, also about a 10% capsaicin sensor, heat sensor triple E1 positive, which is high his level. What's the remaining is a neuron, we call a wrong swan transient. They, they are, you are more familiar thinking like classic pain neuron, like track A positive, CGIP positive, morphine sensor, MOI positive, so it's a low and a model, model level trifle one. This is a neuron in the throughout the body. So based on this kind of, and this is wrong swan, it's really genetic switch control this two group neuron development, both at a circuit level and a molecular level. So you can, Based on this anatomic organization about more than 10 years ago, we recognize so is a, the wrong swan position looks like it's in a position in a perfect location, participate this uh, first line defensive reaction because they're all ending in epidermis. Their activation stretch is relatively low compared to the deep you know, uh, nose receptor. And so they should be, could be, you know, locate. And why the, those wrong swan transient neuron in the throughout the body could be deal with this uh, interceptor monitoring body in injury. So at that time, then we already started to think about as a pain field maybe has a tr trouble. We all the behavior analysis, maybe we study the wrong swan persistent neuron, not a study, less study on this group neuron. So I will use this. Example to show you revisit, you know, how we restudy use a new behavioral classification to revisit a function like MRGD positive neuron, which is dense in the skin epidermis and hair follicle, compared to trifle one positive neuron, fast majority 90% are low and median level wrong swan transient. So in 2009, David Anderson, uh, my mentor, former mentor David Anderson, and uh, in collaboration with Alan Bassman lab, studied the trifle one and MRG neuron function. Based on the reflex assay, they try to draw a conclusion that trif one neuron is important for heat pain while MHD neuron for mechanical pain. 
So we, re we redo this experiment. We got the same mice to a blazer MRGD pulse neuron and use intrathecal capsaicin injection to ablate central terminal TV1 neuron. Then we redo the behavior. We find that um, we recapture what is a, a, a Davy and an Allen's funding, like a MRGD neuron is necessary for withdrawal response to the fungal filament. What TV1 neuron is uh, dispensable for this reflex behavior. But when we use a pinch study, pinch evoked with a tonic pain human and a tonic like a lasting licking response in animal. And this licking response is an independent MIGD neuron, but dependent on TV1 positive neuron. And late years, other people studied that when you give the pinch, the tissue injuries, there's a reactive oxygen going to activate so the chemo, chemo receptor, like including trip channel, to sensitize those trip one positive and nociceptors. So use all our assay, we, and, uh, we almost revisit, you know, what's, what's a function, like MRGD neuron looks like it drives a reflex to, and to those uh, mild, punctate, noxious in mechanical stimulation. And why V1 neuron, two V1 neuron, important for pinch if you're licking and tonic pain. And years later, uh, Richard Cooper and uh, Philip you know, Segula and uh, Yan Zhang in China, they all did an optogenetic study and uh, do the to, to study the aversion study, showing that MRGD neuron, when in acute condition, activation of those fiber is not able to produce aversions, whereas the 3V1 neuron can do that. And uh, this is segregation. It's a really nice explain a long-standing puzzle in human. I remember when I attended a symposium organized by Rohini Kuner in, in 2016 or something, I forgot. You know. And uh, when the hand of work, you know, he gives a historical talk, he presents his uh, long-standing puzzle, which they don't understand. When he gives a human pinch stimulation, they the single units recording, and uh, the, this, um, the the they identify a bunch of the polymodal nociceptor with massive firing during the early phase, but during that time, the human subject not feel pain. The pain actually feeling correlated with adaptation of this polymodal nociceptor, and later on study correlated with, with uh, activation of the silent no mechanical nociceptor, which later on those are silent mechanical nociceptor are uh, capsaicin sensitive. They will respond to the immediate from injury tissue gain mechanical sensitivity. So, um, so mean that there is an anatomic organization from the developmental biology and into the functionality. And so at a spinal cord level, then we find a similar anatomical and uh, functional segregation. So, so here we published a paper a few years ago, identify a group a spinal cord neuron marked by the uh, TAC1, you know, the encoding substance P. And neural killing aids. The, the, but this we said is a spinal cord neuron. We have a genetic tool selectively remove this uh, TAC1 neuron only in the spinal cord. And when we studied the behavioral uh, consequence, we found when we measure all those re reflex defensive behavior, includes a reflex for mechanical, heat, or cold, or all, so no major defect. And also behavioral thermal regulation, electric shock causing the freezing, those are like a fear. Uh, related to the defensive response all intact in this mice. But when we look at those uh, leaking response to those stimulation that cause uh, um, like a tonic pain and uh, with a body injury, like uh, we use a skin burn injury model. And uh, again, like uh, for the time pole, you know, 60 degree water bath for 30 seconds. And uh, the mice were leaking, 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 leaking all the time. And this leaking is very much abolished. And we found that the pinch evil licking is also fairly much abolished. Pinch evokes aversive learning, like a conditional place avoidance, abolished. So, so this and the tech one neuron is interesting when we look at anatomy, they including ascending progenitor, direct progenitor median salamic, and all projected superior lateral parabrachian nuclei, which is sent project to the median salamic nuclear, but not to, to those. Uh, uh, lateral salamic nuclei all sent to the more uh, ventral part of the parabrachian nuclei, which connect with the amygdala and, and, and um, nuclear. So here, you know, you can see the series of median pathway driving from the uh, 
uh, spinal pathway driving this tonic pain associated with the body injury, whereas it looks like a lateral pathway um, uh, from the DIG to spinal cord and to the brain, driving some of the reflex defense reaction to external threat. So for acute pain measurement, for now you can see the long time use of the reflex defense reaction because the circuit level segregation, in fact, cannot detect some select loss as a clinically more relevant effect in you know, a tonic pain, including like a skin bone injury pain. So these two circuits, you know, it's not, of course, it's not independent of each other. In fact, they engage an extensive crosstalk, both at an acute condition and a pathologic condition. In acute condition, a lot of time, actually, these two systems um, could be antagonized each other. I can show you a few examples. But in some cases, it could be synergistic, like uh, driving some fear or emotion. And so here, I will give you, you know, some kind of antagonistic interaction between the two systems. Again, I want to remind the, this uh, great you know, Henry Head. You know, and uh, when he analyzed those uh, salamic uh, lesion syndrome, like a lateral salami patient, when he did a sensory you know, testing, he noticed that when you give a normally a noxious stimulation, compared to a healthy side, this stimulation produces a more extensive, more excessive unpleasantness, emotional distress. Or, or if you give warm stimulation, produce excessive or lasting you know, pleasantness. And, then, and then he, in, that's 1911 in his paper, he already predict, he said, the existence of feedback gain control system in the most lateral salamis. Long before we know that salamis reticular nuclear contains all the inhibitor neurons engage this kind of crosstalk from lateral to the median the pathway. He did another crazy talk, even uh, experiment done a few years, you know, earlier called this is a famous crazy like a nerve division experiment on his own hand, and uh, and uh, then he within three years, you know, the um, time, and they he studied the regeneration of the sensory nerve fiber, then started the sensory testing. He found that the first sensation recovery is a dull pain mediated by like this a. Uh, Diffuse, you know, noxious, poorly localized. We now we know this medium by this can see fiber. But the, then, then the, the neuron involves a discriminative, like a tactile or somal discrimination, regenerate later. And, and he noticed that by the time there's a tactile or somal sensation recover, the same noxious stimulation a few months or a few many months ago not produce less pain. And so so he's, he proposed, you know, the, he's the use of epicryptic past sensory pathway. He gives the oldest time to get a functional organization subdivision of some sensory system. He's epicryptic for fine sensory discrimination, or protopathic for dull diffuse pain. And he even predicts, so he's the epicryptic system has a negative impact on protopathic system. It's a right, you know, long before the, you know, the, the gate control series, you know, proposed by Melsack, you know, war in 1965. And he basically put this idea in 1905. And it's another uh, Melsack, and uh, well, this last thing is the most influential uh, gate control series, talk about a sensory transmission is not independent label line, it has engaging uh, in extensive integration within us, even within the spinal cord, including the descending control. Like a low stress mechanical A beta fiber can cross talk with a C fiber nose itself at a spinal cord level. And uh, in the last 10 years, my lab and many other lab together, then not put a lot of understanding within the spinal cord level where the circuits engage with the gate control, like both A beta fiber and uh, also the MIGD pulse, the C5, C nose itself driving the defensive reaction. They can engage a feed forward excitation, a feed forward excitation pathway to connect with the pain, affect pain pathway. But that kind of pathway is gated by feed forward inhibitions. And the, during the pathologic condition, this uh, antagonist interaction disrupted them. In fact, now all the A beta fiber and MRGC fiber now can access the affect pain after no vision, for example. 
So we all know that uh, one of the hallmark for neural pathways is allodynia, it means the pain evoked by innocuous mechanical stimulation. Either due to through central sensitization, like a Cliff Wolf study, or the, or the disinhibition uh, induced by nerve injury, the A beta fiber now, the, the gate control cannot, uh, no longer functional, they will driving the effect pain pathway, A beta fiber or MHD fiber, or not can access effect pain ascending pathway. So at an, under this condition, optogenesis A beta fiber or MHD fiber, which normally is not able to produce any avulsion, not can induce avulsion, um, uh, like, like uh, Rick Cooper and uh, Yan Zhang and Asalab showing that. So, and also, even with this kind of knowledge, that you can see, see so many pain driving pathway. But even with that, at a spinal cord level, several studies from my lab still shown that zero distinct spinal substrate driving sensitized reflex versus sensitized allodynia, like a mechanical allodynia. So, like I should give one example so after nerve injury, the one of the most uh, dominant. Um, pain suffered by human um, is uh, called a dynamic allodynia. So this type of pain, like, like for example, uh, like a neuropsy caused by a post-hepatic neuropsy, and uh, with this nerve region causing the allodynia, even the patient can't put on the closest. Many, my, oh, I already work on dana fiber cancer, in, in, like a, a lot of cancer patients suffer this kind of like a, a neuropsy induced pain, induced by surgery or by chemotherapy. And uh, the most common or important is uh, called a tactile, you know, a dynamic allodynia brushing through or touch through across skin area. But uh, for many years, the pain field also didn't measure this form of uh, allodynia. So we are fortunately uh, talked to Clifford and then, uh, then the uh, Jose, you know, Copa, you know, in, um, in Spain, we, we, we learned an a assay, you know, called the um, dynamic allodynia assay. It's rarely used at, by any people at that time. We identify spinal substrate marked by figure T3 Cree, which, which mediated this kind of like a dynamic allodynia. Like we use a brush, evoke, you know, high pole brush after spin nerve injury can produce a robust, you know, condition of place avoidance, meaning that has produced if, uh, aversion. And this aversion is com almost completely abolished in mice without this figure T3 Cree label spinal cord neuron. And, uh, and in the same mice, we found the, uh, the, the, sorry, and the, the sense that reflect to the phone free stimulation is not changed. And uh, you can see that even though it has some baseline reflex defect in the figure T3 neuron, because figure neuron is a functional, uh, it's a heterogeneous group neuron, but the mice still can perfect, you know, de uh, develop a sensitized mechanical hypersensitivity. So you, if we use the phone free assay, we will miss a crucial role of this group neuron driving one of the most important forms of like a, you know, like a dynamic allodynia. And also, I, in the next two, a few slides left, you know, showing that we also recently studied the physical pain, which I think that one is another impact on translational success is the vast majority study, we measure pain in the skin because it's relatively easy to measure, but in fact, it's not so easy as we just discussed. And, uh, but relatively, the physical pain is a major complaint for most many patients, and, uh, but it's greatly understudied. Jerry Gephardt and Tim Hess, you know, those are 1988, they developed this coronary rectal distension, which in human, that coronary rectal distension can evoke pain. And uh, they, we use this model to, uh, they, this coronary rectal distension in mice with colitis can even normally, an inoculous like this, uh, strains can produce a robust, you know, physical model reflex. And we found this physical model reflex it's not a change or not impacted by ablation of the figure T3 neuron. But we pay attention, another assay developed by Hess and Gephardt, which is called a step-down aversive learning assay. And this assay is kind of like a real-time, like a um, um, yeah, uh, aversive learning assay. Like you put a mice in a patch dish, then you lift the cup, then you, in the two minutes, uh, cut off time, measure. If, whenever the mice come down to the floor, you give the 
colon rectal distension. After four to six trials, at white time mice will learn to stay onto the catch dish. Cutoff time is 120 seconds. The, so the, but when, you know, ablated mice, this learning is a fairly much abolished. This kind of like a residual learning curve is a, it's a mimic like even sham like distension. So mean that the aversion evoked by normally inoculum mechanical stimulation almost completely abolish uh, in this uh, uh, new frequency signal ablated mice. We check some colitis itself is not a great impact. So you can see that from those evoked pain study I just discussed, the current reflex assay not able to detect some select loss of you know, acute effect pain. In terms of spinal cord substrate, this sensitive, sensitive reflex also cannot detect a select loss of dynamic allodynia, or dynamic neural passing allodynia. Also cannot detect the effect components of the mechanic allodynia in, in, with the infra inflammatory you know, colorectal distension. So, so you can see that, you know, I think this, uh, because so many labs, you know, using this uh, reference assay, I think this is uh, one of the reasons for the causing the poor translation of success. But so far, what I discussed so far, I think we are still have a lot of limitation. We still measure evoked pain, but we had not yet able to measure a lot of, for a lot of chronic pain model, like I say, we need more assay to measure spontaneous pain or pain comorbidity like anxiety, depression, or cognitive uh, decision and defects. And if you want to improve the translation of success, I think we had to put more energy to develop. Like recently, like for neural passive and Xin Zhongdong and Johns Hopkins, they try to show some like a spontaneous, like a guarding or licking behavior as one of the potential to measure spontaneous pain. After like Jeff McGill, like a a facial like a, a grimace, like a measurement uh, could have potential to measure some spontaneous pain. So the I'm ending, this is my last slide, you know, I want to show you that, but I told you, you know, mean that the behavior we can measure, we can improve, but it need a lot more effort. But I want to point another, I think probably even larger challenge for future translational success. Of course, this is my personal opinion. I think that we facing a problem, I think called redundancy, like the, the presence of redundant pain pathway. As we study the spinal cord, we just realized that so many pathways can drive the pain, morphine sensing, morphine resistant. And uh, even like uh, in a median salamic, like uh, in acute condition has segregation, but in a chronic condition with a lateral pathway sensor, you can also converge. So you could talk sound like a most convergent region like ACC, but uh, I think that the redundancy is a real challenge, meaning that single molecule targeting so far has not yet fairly successful. And then hopefully my opinion is wrong. And so I think that in last like six, seven years, I had I had my lab has been thinking and working on start to work on acupuncture. One of the motivation is to try to overcome this redundancy. I think that all the, a lot of study we pay attention to manage the pain symptoms, mean that we try to block the pain pathway. But I think that the more maybe effective way in the future, we have to um, um, pay attention to the root of the, uh, the disease, like the, the inflammation that's so driving those redundant pathway. So, and uh, the one of the, a lot of success, you know, clinics have shown that acupuncture can, be effective to relieve a number of the um, uh, chronic pain condition. No matter the you know, people controversy regarding the sham control or real acupuncture, any difference or not, but uh, the borderline is acupuncture showing the superior you know, efficacy to treat a number of the chronic pain, like from the human clinic trial study in, down in Germany, for example. So we are put a lot of energy now to, to, um, to study the how the acupuncture can modulate the nerve immune talk tissue interaction or can modulate the inflammation, can drive the redundant pathway. I do not have time because, for example, we recently published a paper in Nature last year, for example, showing that from hindling region can drive the somatosensory autonomic or vagal adrenal pathway, can powerfully impact the inf inflammation. 
I think this is called an autonomic dimension of the pain, or you can say how the somatosensory stimulation can drive the, some autonomic pathway, can module immune activity and module inflammation. I think that kind of direction, pain field may need to pay more attention. And that's one of the, my motivation come back to China to interact more with the traditional Chinese medicine community and then to, to study the neural anatomy basis behind acupuncture practice. So here's the, the, my group people mapping those spinal cord circuits you know, with a long time collaboration with Martin Golding at the Sock Institute. And my insight into those uh, functional organizations actually really come from developmental biology and study, starting with a developmental bi biology study. And this is the people I collaborate with in Chinese, uh, China, several groups in China, in Fudan University and the Beijing Institute of Acupuncture, Moxie Baton, to study those somatosensory autonomic pathway that can modulate inflammation. And we will, at the Westlake University in China, here, I will continue to expand this kind of research. So I will stop here and we'll look forward to the question and the discussion. Wow, what a fantastic lecture. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. And uh, okay. so much food for thought. I'm, I'm so glad we recorded this and that I'll be able to go over it again and um, mm -hmm. listen to some details that I may have missed. Um, I will, may I start with um, a simple question? Maybe it's not so simple, but maybe the answer is not so simple, but at least the question is simple. Having criticized the behavioral readouts for the animal studies, what should we do? Imagine we want to test a new drug for neuropathic pain, inflammatory pain. Do we need a whole battery of tests? Could you recommend two or three? Do we still need the old reflexive tests or should we forget them completely? What is your recommendation? Yeah, um, yeah, thank you, Claudia, for, yeah, yeah, it's a difficult question, not a simple question, so, <laughs> so it's a, I think, and I think not to say we, we threw away the reflex assay, so reflex, as I say, in a pathologic condition, like, at least uh, when we study the DRG, like MIGD, a beta fiber, they engage the reflex, and the, but the, um, those fiber also engage, in, you know, the affect pain now, so mean that also we don't know that the MIGD or a beta different subset or driving the reflex or, or pain, we don't know. But at least say at a pathologic condition, some of those reflex can access pain pathway. I mean that they, maybe you need a cocktail to block not one, but a multiple pathway. It's, an, it's, an, it's not to say, or oh, the reflex study in a pain field. Uh, no, it's, it's still, still very important. Um, I should not dismiss <laughs> all this accomplishment we made in you know, so many years. So, but, as, but uh, we do continue the, um, because people say, oh, Chibu, you only come out as a licking essay, but, uh, you know, Jeff McGill and so, you know, this, when you, so the licking is not necessary. It's, it's another model, you know, outcome. So I mean that, so at least uh, we, for acute pain, we use some of the assay we know in a human with producer tonic pain, like a real skin burn injury or like a, like a pinch, like clipping. And for neuropathy pain, we use a brushing, if, but we not only measure the dynamic allodynia score, but we measure the brush evoke, you know, avulsions. And like for the visceral as well, like we just not just measure visceral motor reflex, but uh, so the, so mean that we, we need a more assay, but even that people argue, I remember doing, in public, this paper, perspective article, people say, oh, you know, what happened you, is a defect, just the motor outcome defect, you know, the, the because visceral, even CPA or the licking. And I think mean that we had to do a, a set of study, like when we started TAC1, we had to show the loss of behavior, gain of function, we drive the behavior. We shown the anatomy, shown this neuron, necessary for the C4 induction in a PB and a median size, you know, salami region. Like in some ACC region, ACC region, unfortunately, so much noise like C force, but maybe people can do in the future like functional imaging or two functional imaging. So I think that you need a such a um, combination. Like each assay has some caveats, but in combination, maybe you can. Uh, of course, that's demanding. You know, the, um, 
but I think we we need to continue to develop more assay. And uh, as I'm, I say, you know, we still need to study more the spontaneous pain, like even fistula. We still try to watch more, you know, what how can we measure, you know, some spontaneous pain, which I think that's a major major challenge. I think we should have. Yeah. That so more people need to invest energy to develop more assay. I think. Yeah. So I understand it's individual. You have you need a combination of tests, and you have to adapt it to your specific question. Uh, just a reminder to the audience, please, you can put your questions into the Q&A field and uh, we'll be happy to pass them on. Um, I have lots of more questions, but I will first hand over to Heike if I'm sure you have some <laughs> pressing questions too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much um, for your very um, inspiring talk. Um, I remember I, I had a um, student um, doing some ac acupuncture work, and um, mm. I was wondering um, what your um, what your idea of um, acupuncture is. Um, I'm I'm also working as a clinician, and um, patients demand this, and we have some diseases where we have good evidence that it helps. Um, but for me, it's it's always a black box, and um, yeah, yeah. I, I, I find it hard to. Um, I, I mean, I, I think we should open um, to to more ideas. So I would like to hear your thoughts about this. Yeah. It's, um, so the my acupuncture, yeah, I have been thinking it almost for like uh, ten years. So I think one of the motivation originally, like six, um, six seven years ago, when I discovered was clever. Move, you know, here at a Harvard Medical School, I said, we really impact by like at that time when anti-NGF clinical trial, when the Pfizer yeah. had to stop okay. terminate, when the patient got a pain relief, but you get a joint inflammation getting worse. So, so I mean that at that time I realized uh, behavior over analysis, and if at some point we just not, we should not just pay attention to the behavioral outcome, but also should look into the, any intervention, what's the, the, the disease modification. Mm -hmm. So, so acupuncture the actual works, you know, just start um, five years ago. At that time, we didn't, unfortunately, we, we, we used to choose a relatively, not as a simple model, we use the cytokine release syndrome model induce a LPS and like a bacterial endotoxin. Because at that time, the Palo study in China and following the Kevin Tracy, the, the the neural stimulation or by electronic medicine, you can say you can call acupuncture or electroacupuncture or by electronic medicine. It's really pioneered by Kevin Tracy in some in some degree in New York. And he discovered the vagal nerve stimulation can reduce the uh, inflammation, like including some arthritis. Mm -hmm. And um, so and later on, people use acupuncture and actually pioneer step down in Germany and uh, and um, the, the uh, Rob Schmidt uh, mm -hmm. uh, with Akiosato in 1970s, 80s. And uh, it's mm -hmm. a laid down, it's an amazing insight. And for example, he showed that acupuncture um, uh, stimulation is not random biology. If you, he has really deep anatomic organization. Like for example, he used a pinch actually. He mm -hmm. maps, uh, produce iconic body map in terms of how the mm -hmm. pinch in a different body part can change is a gastric motility. He found a stimulus tool or the, on a, a link region promote gastric motility by driving vagal reflex, while stimulate in the belly inhibit gastric motility by driving gastric sympathetic. So mm -hmm. at that time, then we know that, okay, so there is an amazing crosstalk from somatosensory system to the autonomic nervous system, which modulate almost every aspect, aspect of our body physiology. Which mm -hmm. I think that is one of the scientific basis, say, for acupuncture, why you stimulate your toe can change your you know, whole body physiology. And it's the reason, and uh, all the time people use a meridian channel, people know when know what is the meridian channel, but, uh, but we from neuroscience, we say, oh, so there's, there's the most easy, fast role from somatic, brain, spinal, and autonomic to change your body mm -hmm. physiology. That's uh, my, uh, starting point and uh, recognized like uh, 2014. So then, so that's a, a while. Then we realized that the pain field state is so little from a somatic to autonomic. You think about all oh, people's always high rate of variability measurement, but in overall, 
it's amazingly understudied. And, uh, and also has no genetic tool to manipulate those sympathetic autonomy nervous system. Like we create those kind of tools. So I think that for any chronic disease in humans, there is going to have a nerve immune talk tissue interaction. But each tissue has a unique, it's not a say, same. Like for example, I, I, if I remember correctly, like a, a, the, the NPY label sympathetic neuron innovate heart, but not innovate the lung. For example, you can imagine there is a um, um, body organization and it, the, all the, the target tissue, the same neurotransmitter like noradrenaline can depend different receptor or different target tissue can produce a different kind of outcome. So, so mm -hmm. here is a fairly complex system, biology system, physiology. And I think we just know a little bit. I think that that's what we, I think could be one of the basis, you know, mm, mean that yeah. for every chronic disease, like chronic pain, like a GI tract inflammation or arthritis, we will characterize what is role of different types in the setting, you know, for example, in driving this inflammation or pain. Then we, mm -hmm. can we find a way to tip the balance, you know, mm -hmm. anti inflammation or pro inflammation That's a, one of the major mm -hmm. goals. Hopefully we, we have some success in the near future. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Mm. There's, there's there's another question which is not so easy i i'm not sure if we'll have time for it but the question is you showed so nicely the difference between the interoceptive and the extraoceptive pain system so uh would you speculate that in patients with chronic primary pain in pain where we don't have a a cause that we can see there's something wrong with the interoceptive system a patient with a primary pain. Can you like elaborate? Chronic wide, like chronic widespread pain, where they yeah, just so, have pain everywhere. Yeah. So I think, yeah, like a, like a fibromyalgia, like how can you spread, you know, from, mm. I think by that time, it's a more into the intercept, like it has a, in some kind of, yeah, people say, oh, didn't see the real pathology or some, but how the, they spread out and the, through the central like descending facilitation or something. I don't know detail, but uh, uh, it's more like a, um, do you need a, like a prime, like a preflow, some kind of pathology maintain or, or driving that or not? I think there's still debate, you know, the, mm. there is some, um, so there so could be some source, you know, um, mm. uh, some pathology in the body, you know, muscle, may maintain or driving. And uh, in that case, it's more like interoception. And, and like it's a, like a, in a human study, like a primary sensory testing, when we measure the threshold for the, like, oh, feel pain, like a mechanical soma, I think that study, the first, first pain or facing pain, I think that that pain is more like a, more exteroceptor because the mental state is still like a presence of stimulation causing damage. I think that kind of pain versus a, like a rapid onset, like a sharp pain, I think uh, which morphing, morphing, more morphing resistance is different from like a, those uh, dull tonic pain. I think it, those are first pain, second pain, I think it's fairly, fairly different. And as a, the new definition is a pain by ISP, I think, I don't think it extensively, you know, distinguishes this kind of different type pain. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we still have to work on that. <laughs> yeah, <clears throat> right. Yeah, um, Ben is back. He's probably wanting to remind us that the hour is almost over. <laughs> yes, yes. Thank you, thank you very I, much, Claudia. I want to, yeah, yeah, I want to echo uh, Claudia and Heike, and thank you so much for your fantastic presentation uh, and an insightful Q and A session. Uh, to everybody in the audience, uh, as a reminder, this webinar will be uploaded um, to IISP's Pain Education Resource Center for later viewing to both members and non-members of IISP for free. Um, and please keep in mind that our next webinar is scheduled for November 29th uh, on translating pain knowledge of rare diseases and understudied mm -hmm. ethnic groups uh, focusing on sickle cell anemia. Uh, and that'll be conducted by Dr. Keisha Roach. Uh, so thank you all once again for joining us and have a great rest of your days. So thank, thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.